I have a bit of a confession. Not too long ago, I didn't really believe in the importance of the individual. Now, I know that's sort of an awkward stance uh, to be taken by someone who had recently written a book about how to live a lower environmental impact life in New York City, but it's true. I more or less lost my faith that there was any way to change the behavior of enough people in the world to deal with the scale of the problems at hand. In the energy, climate, and environment space that I work in, for instance, something like climate change isn't going to be solved by simply changing your light bulbs. So, from the realm of the individual, from advising people on how to green their lives and green their homes, the focus of my work spread broader and broader. And my vantage point rose like a hot air balloon. And I could see exploring solutions on a broader and broader scale, looking beyond the streets and neighborhoods of New York City, beyond the five boroughs, looking at the whole nation and then the whole planet. And my vantage point reached all the way up to the atmosphere, where today carbon dioxide is in uh, levels of concentration that haven't been seen in 15 million years. Then, it was so warm that there was no Arctic ice cap. Sea levels were at least 75 feet higher than they are today. So from this atmospheric perspective, looking down at the entirety of this warming world for solutions, at this planet with a fever, I started reading and reporting on the science, reading scientific journals, studying policy, arguing nuances in federal energy legislation. And I started believing, well, hoping, that the time might be right, that the leaders might be ready to lead, and we might actually see some action on climate change on the national and international level. Well, then, Copenhagen happened. Now, I'd been asked to join a reporting project where young people from a dozen or so countries around the world were to track their country's uh, positions in the climate talks and the lead up to COP15 in Copenhagen. You might remember that these were the meetings where world leaders were going to solve climate change once and for all. Well, they didn't. Now, in Copenhagen, we saw plenty of posturing, heck of a lot of arguing, some actually impressive last-minute scrambling by the heads of state to save a little face. But what we didn't see was leadership. Here we are, facing the gravest threat to our collective health, safety, security, economic stability, general well-being of our global community, and world leaders punted on climate change like it was another round of trade talks. So why did this happen? We hadn't yet shown our leaders how to lead. I know that sounds backwards, but if the last 12 months have shown us anything, it's that we need to show our leaders the way. There's a dirty secret in Washington and in power centers around the world. Politicians aren't leaders. They're followers. We need to show them how it's done. So my balloon burst, and I returned to the ground. Coming from the UN, where progress is measured in pages of negotiating text, I couldn't wait to connect with real change makers on the ground again. People actually making a difference. People finishing projects. People getting things done. It's important, getting things done. These are people like Scott Frank, projects like One Earth Designs. It's a nonprofit that Scott started. Met with communities in the rural Himalayas, asked them what they needed, collaborated on some designs. Together, they created the Soul Source. It's this shiny umbrella looking thing you see in the middle there. Soul Source is a lightweight, low cost solar energy device. You can cook with it, you can heat your home with it, it can generate electricity. It's a life improving 
sometimes life-saving device. Talking about projects like, like Limitless Vistas in New Orleans. Here, a couple of dedicated community members decided to create some opportunities for the young men and women in their city. Teach them how to weatherize homes, train them to make them more energy efficient, create these green collar jobs you keep hearing about. In turn, Residents in the Big Easy start saving some money on energy bills. And this great American city that's so incredibly vulnerable to climate change reduces its carbon footprint. It's a win-win-win sort of project. I'm talking about projects like True Light, where my dear friend Chris Nidal works with students uh, in, from New York City public schools, mostly first-generation immigrants to the country helps them start a business, marketing and selling compact fluorescent light bulbs and other home energy saving devices. They bring them home to their communities, to their neighbors, sell them to their families and friends. These immigrant communities, so often looked by this elite green movement, well now they're apart because of projects like True Light. And when I landed back on the ground, rediscovering all this actual change, I was lucky to land back at Good. And Good's a media company, it's dedicated to helping people live well while doing good. And we do more than just media. We really try to connect with our community. Just so happened that Good had partnered with, um, with Pepsi on the Pepsi Refresh Project. We were to help the company give away tens of millions of dollars in grants to people with great ideas that were going to make a positive impact in their communities or beyond. These are projects like Green Shields. Here you see Johnny Cohen. 14-year-old high school freshman, the audacity to think that his school bus ride could be more fuel efficient. If only the bus didn't have such a flat front, if only it were more aerodynamic. So he designed a solution, the Green Shield, ran some computer simulations, received a grant. Next week, he's going to be running his second set of tests on a real bus, on a real testing track, in the real world. This isn't policy talk. These are real fuel savings. These are real carbon cuts. And this is where change happens on the ground, where one or a small group of dedicated, tireless, usually completely unreasonable people <laughs> decide that they want to make a positive impact beyond themselves. They decide that someone on the other side of the planet should be able to read at night without the expense and filth of burning kerosene or a diesel lantern. When a few neighbors decide they want to make their community safer, cleaner, greener. When a 14-year-old, for goodness sakes, decides that his school bus ride to school shouldn't guzzle so much gas. Now. I still read the science, and I still argue the policy nuance. And realistically speaking, we're not going to solve climate change with even 10,000 projects like Green Shields and True Light. But they are essential in building the movement. And that is why movement building is so critical. These projects prove the concepts of positive progress to our leaders, and they make that political action possible. What's more, these projects immediately improve the lives of others, and there's nothing more important that a human being can do. It's up to all of us to lead our leaders. It's up to all of us to make that change inevitable. Thank you.